Hello, welcome to the new Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. Thanks for joining us today. One buzzword that, uh, I mean, it's not a new thing, but we hear is uh, microservices. Mm -hmm. What is it? Well, microservice, if you, it's best to, easiest to understand microservices in the context of the previous architecture of the client server era, which was monolithic three tier SOA style applications, the front end, the middle tier business logic, and then back end data store like a database. In those kinds of architectures, the front end actually consists of many different types of functionality, the middle tier consists of many type, different types of functionality. There might be something that is transaction processing with the back end, something else that is talking to a customer database. And when you've got a monolithic application, what you saw was slow release cycles, which were in match with the kind of IT infrastructure that ex everybody was using. But when you go to uh, the agile world that the cloud offers, which is on-demand instant creation of compute resources, that old model breaks down and what you've got is a mismatch between the delivery model of the application architecture and what the underlying platform can provide. So microservices have come along as a way to break down the monolith into its constituent pieces and have different developers, maybe even teams, contribute and develop those and then release them independently of every of the other teams that are working on the other microservices of the larger application. And that provides this level of agility that in the application architecture that can then match the agility benefits that the underlying infrastructure can provide. And the fact is that in uh, many complex applications, if you're not doing that, then you're not going to be competitive. So the, this microservices uh, approach has been driven both by trying to take advantage of the infrastructure as well as to remain competitive. And that doesn't mean it's the answer in all cases, mm -hmm. but in certainly in complex projects that have multiple teams or different pieces evolving at different rates or scaling differently, then it's very effective. What kind of challenges are also there? So like I said, it's not the one-size-fits-all yes. answer. And certainly for a smaller project, if it's just a front end talking to a database um, and just a single team, a few people working on it, it doesn't make much sense to break it up into little pieces. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a lot of benefit out of it from scaling or from delivery. When you do decide to break up a large project, there comes some cost with it You know that hopefully is made up by the benefits of the architecture. Those costs are added complexity because now you've got a bunch of moving parts you've got to maintain these API contracts between the parts. And so that's one of the, if you want to really take advantage of microservices, you need to have this strict API protocol so that pieces can rev independently of the others. You don't say, my component's revving, so you need to go change your API. You change yourself and, and keep the API constant. So uh, that's one aspect. You mentioned network and network latency and network hops. That starts to become another factor if it's a high throughput application that needs low latency, then you need to take that into account as you design and place your microservices, put the ones that are talking frequently with one another close to each other. Uh, monitoring becomes much more important when you're monitoring this complex mm -hmm. distributed system and you have something that fails in one place, it could be the cause, you know, the root cause is someplace else, and you need to use a lot of correlation to figure out exactly what happened after the fact. So uh, that said, the, like I said, in many cases, the bent, those kinds of costs that come with it are outweighed by the benefits you get. Uh, one, one more, uh, it's, once again, it's not a new thing, cloud native. Mm -hmm. So how does microservices fit into the cloud native landscape? Well, well like I said, cloud, microservices kind of evolved um, con coherent, you know, consistently with the rise of cloud native architecture what, what in, cloud underneath. Native? Well, I, the width, so it's on-demand instant scale, mm -hmm. I think. If you take a look at the servers of the IT client server era, you'd you say, oh, I want to scale out. So you go to you know, IT it's shop months and say, and yeah. Years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and even with virtualization, it still took weeks or months. In the cloud, you want to scale out, and it's seconds or minute, right, to uh, scale out and add another resource. And so that's what cloud native is, an architecture that just intrinsically takes advantage of that kind of capability of the infrastructure. And I think it has, it's, it's less about technology. It's also changed the culture you know, within companies. It's broken down the silos. You're making a lot of decisions yourself. You don't have to worry about a networking team, and yeah, storage exactly. team, and database yeah. team make everything. Coming back to the point of uh, uh, microservices in the cloud native world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so um, like I said, microservices m fit nicely with that cloud native infrastructure underneath. Where you see the next step of microservices where things went was the rise of containerization with Docker a few years ago where people said, hey, I now can, I've got this independent building block, I want to package that up and 
and have a way to resource isolate it so that it works the same in my laptop as it does in a production environment and it can sit alongside other microservices mm -hmm. on the same virtual machine or server and yet not be interfered with. And so I've got higher reliability and reproducibility of my, what I experience in my test environment. So containerization fit nicely with microservices at the same time. And so that's another aspect of the evolution of that architecture. And since you're, you're CTO, you know, yeah. so I'll be throwing a lot of buzzwords, yeah. <laughs> new buzzwords. So the other buzzword is serverless yeah, or functional. I, I figured we were going there. Yeah. Uh, the, the funny thing is that uh, there is a server in a serverless. There is, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a misnomer in some yeah, sense. It depends, but... you know, without a server, you cannot have a server. Yeah. So can you talk about, you know, the, 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 uh, the evolution of serverless as we touch upon VMs, you know, and data centers. So it's, it's the same evolution curve or is something mm -hmm. new just, you know, just popped up? Or can you talk about that? Yeah, that's a, a great question because I think, you know, we saw microservices, microservices, then containerization with microservices. The next step is serverless, and serverless was really defined by the first steps of this function as a service. Azure Functions being one example of that, where it's event-driven. Developer provides their piece of code, and the platform takes care of everything else, launching the code in response to an event, and managing its lifecycle and the infrastructure underneath it. It's called serverless, not because there's not servers, because it does run on a server, but because the developer doesn't worry about the servers. And so the developer just worries about their piece of code. And from a cost perspective, they pay only for the piece of code as it, the, the time it runs and the amount of resource it consumes while it runs. They don't pay for a server sitting there indefinitely. They, they don't have to worry about the launch time of the server and the shutdown time of the server and that cost of that. It's just my code gets activated, it runs, I just pay for that. And what that provides, what that enables is the developer just focuses completely on the business logic of the application and nothing about the infrastructure really. And so serverless also represents that, this move up into providing this platform where developers can just focus on the logic of their application and say, here's the logic of the application, here now infrastructure, you just go make it work. You take care of running it, you take care of scaling it, you take care of uh, keeping it healthy. And that's first step of functions of service is leading into other types of, of serverless that are richer and richer and maybe targeted at certain business uh, scenarios. So Logic Apps is an example of a serverless platform we have in Azure where a business developer, not even a professional developer, can write an application in a serverless way where they just write basically rules that are like Excel regular expressions and create a workflow that is powered underneath with you know, servers and code that runs on the servers, but they pay only for the workflow when it executes. They don't worry, they don't know anything about the servers, it automatically scales, and it, it's kept reliable by the underlying infrastructure. And you can, the, the huge value proposition of this, of course, is not just I worry about the business problem, but the time to value is much shorter. I'm not creating applications and deploying them. I'm, here's my logic, I give it to the platform and it's take care, care of everything else. Yeah, that's because uh, I think a lot of resources get wasted and just keep the machine running yeah. instead of you know you actually focusing on what your business needs. Like I think seventy percent of resources get wasted and you know, just to keep yeah, the just the, just the background. Yeah, and yeah, so and then the, the cloud world, the the at the scale we've got with the multi tenancy we have, the cloud provider can absorb that kind of extra overhead, mm -hmm. but and make it very efficient, very cost effective. Uh, one curiosity that uh, how tied are these functional service to a platform, whether it's like Azure or either Google or Manager or them, uh, because nowadays we talk about multi-cloud, we talk yeah. about interoperability. So is, is that the risk there, or you think um, as well, it will evolve, it will go better? Yeah, great question. In the case of of Azure, we're very focused on making sure that we address hybrid specifically, and then also um, try to make sure customers that want to be multi-cloud can, can be successful multi-cloud using our technology. So in the case of Azure Functions, it's actually open source. Mm -hmm. And so, and not only that, but we make it available on Azure Stack so you can take it on-premises. You can run it on your own, you know, Azure Functions, you can deploy to your own devices. You can deploy it on an AWS VM if you want to. You can deploy it on an Edge device if you want to. So that was a, a very conscious decision on our part to open source the runtime and to make it possible for it to run in all these different places. But what was the what was the reason behind deciding you know to 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 keep it open source where even your competitors can use it? I think if we go back to the you know the question you asked earlier about what's the value of open why does a company like Microsoft it goes back to that it goes to and in this case especially with developer um, runtimes and frameworks open source means that developers themselves can participate in evolving the technology also it's great as a debugging help because if there's an, an issue they can look right at the code if they've got 
you know, maybe the documentation's vague on something or they misinterpret something, with the code right there, they can go right and look and see, here, here's the absolute answer. There's, it's in black and white right in the code. Um, and in the case of, of you know, concerns of vendor lock-in, of course, making it open source makes it so that somebody can say, hey, I can take this, I can run it someplace else um, if I want to. It's not this locked in black box that now I'm beholden forever to whoever produced it. Thanks for watching. Listen to more episodes of the News Tech Makers at thenewstech.io slash podcasts. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening and see you next time.